I'm hooked on this niche sport called disc golf. Some people call it frisbee golf. Please don't call it froth. A bit geeky? I don't care. I'm in love with the act of throwing hard plastic frisbees into baskets. It also happens to be one of the fastest growing leisure sports in North America, if not the world. There's even a pro tour, and it's my favorite thing to watch on YouTube. So soothing. And no, I won't be joining the tour anytime soon. <laughs> One day last summer, I was out throwing around by myself, trying to, you know, improve my game. And I came across a young family. They were obviously new to disc golf, and I soon discovered that they were new to Canada as well. I gave them a few tips about the game and soon found myself engrossed in their story. Their sad yet triumphant journey found out this family of four was from Syria, and they had lived through the early days of its devastating civil war. Their neighbor's house in Aleppo, Syria's largest city, was obliterated by a bomb, so they decided to move across town to a relative's home. But they could not escape the misery and heartache of what Aleppo had become. The ancient city used to be magnificent, one of the oldest continuously inhabited urban centers on this planet but it's been bombed beyond recognition today. The father of the family, Mohammed, said it was not unusual to see the body of a friend lying in the street. He said it made his heart feel old. So Mohammed left for Lebanon. He worked seven days a week as a carpenter, save enough money to move his young family out of Syria, which he did almost two years later. His family joined him in Lebanon, where both Mohammed and his wife, Tasneem, worked really hard, hoping for a better life for their two children who were under the age of five. The family applied for refugee status and were sponsored by a nonprofit group in Nelson. So in 2016, the Mustats arrived in the Coonies. Very little English, very little money, and two kids about to enter elementary school. Initially, they found the move to Nelson hard, but they have since thrived in this beautiful place. They found work, the kids are in school, they've learned a new language, adapted to a new culture. My own family has been in this area for over 100 years. We've never known such struggles. Early on, homesteading was tough in the basin. Then there was the Great Depression, and young men, like my great-grandfather, left to fight in World War I for four years. But it was nothing like what the Mustats went through. No bombed homes and bodies in the streets of their cities and towns. On this afternoon, it seemed like the family was just enjoying the forest together, throwing discs at baskets, trying out their English on a stranger. It reminded me of how profoundly fortunate I am to live where I do. <laughs> I'm Mitchell Scott, Editor-in-Chief of Kootenai Mountain Culture Magazine, and this is The Headwaters, brought to you by Columbia Basin Trust. In this episode, we're going to meet people who have recently arrived to the basin, people who now call this area home, often because the place they were born is no longer an option. They're helping to shape the Kootenais, making it a more vibrant place. They are the newcomers. And if you haven't met them yet, it's time you did. We'll start with the story of an immigrant some of you might know. He's a pretty famous local. Edmund Segbiaya arrived a couple of decades ago and immediately endeared himself to the people of the Kootenays. Bob Keating has his remarkable story. Yeah, right you are, Mitch. Incredible indeed. Edmund is not a newcomer to this area, per se. He arrived here around the same time I did, which is just over two decades ago. But he became known and loved by many, I'd say, in a very short period of time. One, because of his incredible hot sauce, but also his outgoing personality. And his journey here to the Kootenays, too, which is a remarkable tale in itself. In what way? Well, let's head out to the commercial kitchen, where he makes his legendary Abese Zozo hot sauce, and have him tell the story. Oh, Bob, come on in! <laughs> Edmund greets me at the door with a smile. 
when I got there, he was putting labels on jars of red hot Abese Zozo hot sauce, one of eight lines he sells commercially. Have you tried it? I have, and it makes me sweat profusely. Of course, it makes me sweat just thinking about it. <laughs> but selling that hot sauce was never his intention when he came to Canada. That happened as a lucky accident. So how did he get here in the first place? Well, Edmund's from Togo in West Africa. And as a kid, he had a pretty good life there, he says, in Togo, as the oldest of four kids. But when he was in university, things started to grow trouble. How so? Togo was run by a strong man named the Singbi Ayadema for almost 40 years, one of the longest-running dictatorships in Africa, and indeed the whole world. As Edmund became an adult, people of Togo, Edmund included, began to agitate for change. They wanted democracy, or something near to it. But that was a dangerous thing to publicly talk about back then. Because we were under dictatorship when we were grown up, uh, it's only one party, politic, and it was very difficult, and uh, many people were killed, some people were sent in the prison, and in cemetery, or the best option, you run away from the country. And uh, in 91, I decided to leave. I went to Germany. So Edmund flees to Munich with very little money and no plan. He just had to get out of Togo, a pretty typical immigrant story from repressive parts of the world. While living in Munich, Edmund sets up a lobby group and tries to bring about change in Togo from the outside, which did not help his cause to immigrate. So he's a bit of an activist, but uh, why is it difficult to immigrate for him? At one time, Germany was the colonial power in Togo. It was called Togoland back then. And the premier of Bavaria, where Edmund was living in Munich, was friends with the dictator. So Edmund kept getting rejected as a permanent refugee because he was still advocating for change in Togo. It's like the old line from the Neville Brothers song. There's freedom of speech until you say too much. And his future's uncertain at best and dangerous at worst when he decides to flee to a church. We've heard this story before. He seeks refuge in yes. often a, a religious building, yes. a religious group. Went there with his wife, who's joined him by this time, and their infant daughter, first in that church, then a monastery. Monastery. So how long do they stay there? Three and a half years. Oh, goodness. Yes, three and a half years confined to the grounds of a church, then monastery. If he leaves, he knows he's now putting his whole family at risk. Being in hiding with a little girl, she was only six months, and she became close to four years before we moved to Canada. It's so difficult. Depressing, not easy. You can go only to the garden. We are not allowed to go out of the, the, the parish. Wow, what a hardship for a young family. So we got to know, how did he get out? Well, he had a chance meeting with a Canadian who visited him there in seclusion. And she had this connection to Nelson. And back here, seven churches began organizing to sponsor Edmund and his young family to emigrate to Canada. They did a bunch of legwork at this end, approached immigration authorities, got the paperwork in order, and made a case for the family to get out of Germany. Finally, after a lot of wrangling, Edmund got a date when he could leave with his family. So I've, you've told me this story, and the date's a crazy date. Yes, it's September 11, 2001. you got to be joking. I know. After almost four years confined to a church and monastery, he's supposed to fly on the only date in modern history where every plane in the world is grounded. So did all this work to get him out come to a halt, or what happened next? It came to a halt temporarily. People scrambled here and got him a new date when planes resumed flying about three weeks later. And they came to Canada and freedom. And so freedom comes with super hot sauce? Or? No, no. That was a lucky coincidence, too. Edmund loves hot food. And he often went to the co-op and cleaned them out of hot peppers to make his hot sauce. He was using his great-grandmother's two-century-old recipe to make this hot sauce for himself and his family. When one day, a manager at the co-op asked him, Why are you buying up all our peppers? And asked for a sample. And a Bessé Zozo hot sauce is born. And I know it's taken off. Uh, You could say it's burning up the shelves. Yeah, you can say that. I never would. (laughs) It didn't take off immediately, by the way. But then Edmund's invited to hot sauce competitions in the southern U.S. where hot sauce is a thing and there's connoisseurs down there. And doesn't he start winning? Not a few competitions, but 11 in total. 
Then back here in Canada, he's famously invited to compete on the Dragon's Den, the wildly popular CBC program, so he goes to Toronto for that. How to go there? Did they uh, light up his business with uh, new finance? No, no, he burned them up. I want you to just give this a listen. Okay. Finally, Edmund Segbayaya from Nelson, B.C., with his line of fiery sauces. And how much money do you need? 400000 <laughs> Oh my god! That's my water. That's <laughs> You'd think a dragon would be able to handle a bit of heat. I know, exactly. But by that point, it didn't matter because Edmund's hot sauce had taken off and is loved by many. But also because Edmund is the perfect salesperson for his sauce. He's selling himself and his incredible story, and people buy it. I caught up with him a second time at a farmer's market as he was making his unique pitch. People know my hot sauce, but they personalize the hot sauce because of me. And, uh, yeah, and I, I, I don't stay home. I go to any event like a festival, trade show, farmer's market. I'm on Baker Street. Come and throw some couscous. Couscous is ready. Hot sauce. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only way I promote. You know, in Africa, when you are at the market, you have to grab people. I have to sell my sauce. That's the only way. <laughs> it's so delicious. No vinegar taste, no sugar, no MSG, no chemical. Taste. All made here for the past 20 years. What a personality. Yeah, he a, is. a guy who carved out a life here in the Coonies. And as we said off the top, he's become kind of famous in this region. I, I see him all over the place. Yes, yes. And he raised a family here. He's got three kids with another on the way at the time of this taping. His eldest daughter is acting in Stratford. He speaks four languages, has tremendous business acumen, and pretty much knows everyone. You know, Mitch, when people say immigrants are taking our jobs... I don't think that's the case. That is not the case at all. They're working dust till dawn most times, creating their own jobs, or doing the work us Canadians refuse to do. People like Edmund make where we live a better place. Simple as that. And he credits this community with helping him do it. Of course. Without Nelson community, without people, I can't be where I am today. Because uh, they were supportive, they pushed me, and by the word of mouth, my problem was everywhere. I go home sometimes to visit my family, but I'm always happy to come back to Nelson, yeah, where it's my new home, yeah. And long time ago, I became Canadian, my family, everybody's Canadian, which is great. <laughs> yeah, you're a trailblazer, I guess, Edmund. Was that hard at the start? Uh, when I came here, it's very difficult to find a black person from Africa. The only family from Nigeria, they were based in Winnipeg and they moved back. And many people were Jamaican, Trinidad, yeah, Caribbean people, they are coming and getting more multicultural Nelson, yeah. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, yeah, yeah. Canada is a multicultural country, yeah. <laughs> some good hot sauce? It's so good. <laughs> What a journey. The stories and the resolve of immigrants like Edmund are truly inspirational. But you might ask, how did they even know the Kootenays are an option? We know this place is special, but from a global perspective, we're way off the beaten track. Graham Tracy met a group that helps attract newcomers and make the transition to living here. Take it away, Graham. Mitch, let's mingle and have a light dinner at a Selkirk College celebration. About a hundred people are here, and they're speaking at least a dozen different languages. I stroll up to the table of Ilshad Kazanov from Bashkortostan, a Russian republic near the Ural Mountains. Ilshad is here with his wife and six-year-old son. He struggles with English, but becomes animated when talking about one of his new passions, fishing. Mm, uh, Kootenay, Kootenay River and uh, Columbia River got some 
rainbow trout. Yeah, <laughs> they're very tasty. <laughs> I I I've, I've never seen the, the, this type of fish here. Dillshot immigrated to Castlegar about a year ago, taking a job in town and making a new home. I'm truck driver, uh, super big truck, wood chip truck. A lot of adventure, especially in the winter. Chaining up, black ice. Yeah, I improved my driving skills. <laughs> the Kazanovs came to the Kootenays with the help of the Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot, a federal program that helps attract immigrants from all over the world to settle here, which is what the Kazanovs plan to do. Because uh, I have a job here. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty ni nice job with uh, pretty nice uh, salary for payment. Now my wife uh, looking for, for studying. Yeah, we, we, we plan to plan live here. This is the kind of success that program coordinator Aaron Rooney aims for. Rooney helps run this pilot program. The program looks for potential immigrants who will stay and take jobs in industries where there is a shortage of workers, such as truck drivers. We help people with their applications to become permanent residents. So either they're already living and working in the region which is the majority of our applicants because they've gone to Selkirk College. So they're international students that have gone to Selkirk College for two years, and then they stay in the region and because they get a, they get a three-year open work permit after they do two-year program at Selkirk. Um, so they're already living and working for employers on an open work permit but would like to become permanent residents. So this pilot helps them with that. But we bring people from overseas as well. The program staff liaise with employers, help with paperwork and bureaucracy, and ensure newcomers feel at home when they are a long way from it. Rooney says the program has helped over 200 immigrants get the paperwork they need to become permanent residents, and a lot more relocated to the Columbia Basin if you count their family members. She finds the work rewarding. I don't know if you've noticed, there's a lot more Indian restaurants, right? And they're popping up in Castlegar, and, and there's a lot more um, diversity and inclusion in our schools. Really good to see more families from all over the world moving here or settling here long term very rewarding yeah i love working with people and their stories and i want my community to be d diverse right it's kind of a win-win for everybody 211 people have received their permanent residency and they're in the community so that feels like that needs a round of applause i wade into the crowd and meet parvinder singh who is originally from Delhi, but now calls Trail home. Better education, better lifestyle, less crime, obviously, and living standard is okay. Peaceful town, beaches, lakes, obviously beautiful. That's why I came here. Parvinder is another success story for the pilot program. He works at Tech and helped bring his immediate family to Canada while getting residency himself. Parvinder has big plans, and he credits the community with helping him realize them. I felt homesick when I came here. This country taught me how to be responsible, how to manage my money, just to balance between my work life, study life. This country made me a man. I was all dependent since I was 22 on my parents, so the best decision I could ever take. Yeah, I just wanted to say to everybody that's in this room today, thank you very much for welcoming me as the Mayor of Nelson. It's a very special honor for me to be standing up before you. I'm an immigrant myself. I came to Canada. The celebration is capped off with a talk by John Dooley, the mayor of Nelson, who immigrated to this region half a century ago. Dooley left Northern Ireland behind during troubled times, like many in this room. In many cases, are potentially fleeing conflict, and they don't have much uh, respect for authority because uh, authority is not a good thing in their homeland. And, I, and that was the same for me in, in the north of Ireland. And I, it was surprising me, to me to find that... Uh, when I landed in Montreal, that the customs agents were as accommodating as they were and immigration um, authorities were as accommodating as they were. Dooley says that's all most newcomers need, a little help, guidance, and friendship. And as mayor, I, I, I make a point of reaching out to people that have come to our community and trying to make them feel comfortable and, and needed and respected. And I think it's really important because that I needed that myself when I first came to Canada. And that was one of the things that I thoroughly appreciated about Canada was that I was accepted for who I was and the skill set that I brought. Aaron Rooney says they're hoping the pilot program is extended and perhaps becomes permanent like the people they attract. 
So we want to bring people to our rural community, but we want them to stay beyond permanent residency. So how well do they fit? Maybe they have they already have friends or family members here. Maybe they're really into mountain biking. You know, what is a good fit in terms of our, our region and how can we also make them feel welcome long term? Cool program, which helps bring diversity to the basin. There's a charity group in the East Kootenai that also brings refugees to the basin. The East Kootenai Friends of Refugee Society has been doing it for more than 30 years, sponsoring people from all over the world and helping them settle here. It's really important work, and it's all done by volunteers. We're going to end with a newcomer who is somewhat of a trailblazer. Basil Fuller is from Jamaica and has an attitude and laugh that is totally infectious. He brought them both here about a decade ago out of sheer curiosity. <laughs> I had my own company back there, and I heard about the work program. I said, I would love to know what the snow is like and to feel what Canada is like. And I remember in the airplane and looking down and see all the snow-capped mountains, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to know what this is like. Two weeks later, driving in, I'm like, oh, dear. (laughs) Basil is a professional truck driver, but he's so much more. He's raising a family in Glade. In Castlegar, he teaches fellow newcomers how to drive trucks in the snow. The snow! And he started a Jamaica-Canada Appreciation Day, which raises money for charities. Basil has become a community leader in the community that took him in. And he loves his new home in the woods. I was a country boy. I only work in a big city because I worked for the government. And I, as soon as I'm done working, I run home. I just love the country. It's nice and peaceful and quiet to see. And here just remind me of that. Same mountain as everything in summertime. For me to be in an area where you don't need your house keys. And the opportunities here is vast. A lot of jobs and a lot more opportunity here. Myself and uh, a bunch of guys here that came up. The first crew that came first set of guys came we were the tip of the spear and the people here are are, well I've had my ups and downs but mostly ups and I try to dwell on the the idea of my glass being half full than half empty you know because everywhere you go you have trials it's just for you to be able to, to say to yourself you know what never allow negativity in your brain and to rise above that and as I said the people that I've come to know here Um, They have treated me very well. And that's our podcast. None of this would happen without the trust. Columbia Basin Trust supports the efforts of people and communities in the Columbia Basin. Learn more at OurTrust.org. It also wouldn't happen without Vince Hemsall, Tara Cunningham, Stacey Michowski, Jesse Lee, and Peter Moynes. Bob Keating and Graham Tracy were our reporters for this podcast. Bob also happens to write and produce the stories you just listened to. I'm Mitchell Scott. Thanks for listening.